Good morning. Welcome again to my living room in July 2016 here in Bertigny in Switzerland. Beautiful summer day. It'll probably rain later as it has been most of the day this week. But the rain and the sun are both good. Rain is not bad weather. We need to re-educate ourselves some of these things we say. I was um, challenged by a, a line in a verse of 1 Peter 1. It's a verse 12. And Peter is talking about the mystery. And we know from other passages, such as 1 Timothy 3.16, that the mystery is, is Christ in us. In other words, God's love is for all peoples not just for his original people, the Jews. And that's the mystery, which is one of the things into which the angels long to look, this passage says. And I got to thinking about that a few years back. And that must mean that um, the angels don't know everything we do. And we are privileged to share certain things that they are not or were not. And it probably works both ways. We have no idea what they know that we don't know. Um, but Paul does say to us, do you not know that you will judge angels? And I still remember the first time I read that as a new Christian. I said, no, I did not know that. <laughs> what in the world does that mean? What qualifies me to judge angels? And, uh, of course, the reason is that we were created at a different place in God's order. And he gave us huge responsibilities in his creation, but also equipped us to be able to carry out those responsibilities. So I'm, I'm imagining the angels... Also, in thinking about the whole question of the Incarnation, which I meditate especially at Christmas time, as we celebrate the, the Incarnation of the Son of God as the baby Jesus. But it's, it's a theme that is challenging more and more people in our day, as we are trying to, I say we, the body of Christ, trying to recover a more incarnational and Trinitarian theology. We've come to the realization, led by just a few theologians a couple generations ago, one was T.F. Torrance, T-O-R-R-A-N-C-E, from Scotland, and then carried on by his son, and then popularized by people like uh, Baxter Kruger, who's on YouTube, by the way, sharing some of this stuff. And I'd encourage you to listen to his message if you can understand his Louisiana accent. He taught at University of Aberdeen after he studied there, and I have no idea how the Scots people understood this guy. But anyway, he's, um, he was introduced to me by Tom Hallis, who got going on this Trinitarian theology, and and we're realizing more and more that we've missed out on some of the, the riches of our Christian heritage by not really thinking deeply about Trinitarian theology and, and thinking really pretty much only about the cross as the center point of, of our theology. Now, we cannot overplay the cross either, of course. But... Um, I think we can safely say that the Incarnation is just as important to us as the cross was. So that's what I want to share about this morning. Not that we have to pick and choose, it's not a binary choice. We just need to uh, not downplay the cross, but bring the Incarnation back to its, to its role. Torrance was inspired by a 4th century theologian named Athanasius. And he went back to those writings and, and got into them and started bringing up uh, a lot of things which we had forgotten for historical reasons. 
So anyway, think with me about the angels. Okay, they've been in heaven a long time. We have no idea how long. We do not know when they were created. Uh, someone asked C.S. Lewis once, why, why, why do we get glimpses of the angels in the Bible, but um, their story is not told? Like when they were created or more about why. Their role now is to be ministering servants to us, but apparently they were created long before we ever were. What was their original role, job description? And C.S. Lewis said, well, it's because this book is our book. It's not their book. Maybe they have their own book, uh, which we are not given access to. All we know is that there are many books in heaven mentioned here and there. Now I am uh, looking forward to checking out the heavenly library. But anyway, the angels are in heaven, having always known since their creation the presence of God in heaven, the three in one, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. Spiritual beings in perfect unity. but three distinct beings in this one incredible unity. And then, somehow, the angels hear that the Son is leaving. He's going to leave heaven. He's not going to be there with them anymore. After who knows how long, thousands of years, the way we count time, maybe, or more, for all we know. They hear he's going to be gone. He's, he will no longer be, be with the, the Father and the Spirit. And how can we imagine their, their amazement at this announcement? And maybe their first reaction when they heard this was to say, well, the Son is going to go back and he's going to lead us as his heavenly host and reconquer earth from Lucifer and his fallen angels. And that's why he's going back to earth. And then they heard, no, he's not going back at the head of an army of the heavenly host. He's going back as a human baby, a human seed, not even a baby at first. And that must have been even more amazing to them. It's, it's more amazing to me the more I think about it. How the infinite son one day emptied himself, we read in Philippians 2. He emptied himself of his divine power and the Holy Spirit came upon him. This is also completely incomprehensible. Came upon this infinite being who, but who had emptied himself the Holy Spirit came upon him and, and shrunk him to the size of a human seed. And then implanted him in the womb of a Jewish teenager, a 15, 16 year old girl. And of course, Mary and her whole story and her, her lineage and her preparation, her, her willingness to accept this, that is uh, that's something that, that deepens for me each time I think about it. And Joseph, these, these two teenagers, he can't have been much older. It's possible, you know, that he was, but it's more likely that he was something like 19, 20 years old. A carpenter. Now Mary was a, the cousin of Elizabeth who came from the high priestly line. So Mary may have been of, she was at least related to that line. What we don't know is that who taught Mary 
the scripture and the, the truths about the character of God that were so uh, clear when she sang her song, the Magnificat. Uh, did she have godly parents? Probably. But she does seem especially close to Elizabeth. Was Elizabeth, her older cousin, kind of her mentor, took her under her wing, as it were, and, and taught her in the things of God. Because when she became visibly pregnant, she didn't stay home. She went to Elizabeth, stayed with her, and was probably, probably taught some more. And we can be sure that Elizabeth was her intercessor during that amazing time. Anyway, this human seed grows in this girl's womb in a regular, normal way. There's nothing supernatural about the way this baby grew. It took nine months. I doubt if there was anything supernatural about the birth. There's a song that's been re written recently, I forget who it's by, but it's a powerful song, sung by a young woman, and the title is, It Was Not a Silent Night, the night that Jesus was born. Mary was alone. This was her first birth, which is usually the most difficult. There was no one with her that we know of except for Joseph. And it was highly unlikely that he had even seen a birth, a Jewish man of his age, much less been prepared to help with one. Mary did not have any older female relatives with her. And what's, what, what must have been most difficult is that normally all of Joseph's family would have been there in Bethlehem that night because it was a census of the whole line of David and all the family had to be there. This is why he was there with Mary. His, his female relatives, his mother and aunts and older cousins, would have all have been in the village. But they were no help. They were not there because of the shame of this, this girl who got pregnant before she was married. And of course, even if Joseph would have tried to explain the situation to them, how could they believe? We find, we find it hard to believe now. What must it have sounded like to the, that Jewish family? So that was also part of the pain of that night. It wasn't just the physical pain of childbirth, but Joseph being unable to help a young husband. And then being alone, being left alone by his family. But we need to realize that when Jesus then started to grow, he, he grew up as a completely normal looking boy, then young man. So much so that when the people of Nazareth, the village where he spent his whole life, when they started hearing these things about him, they said, isn't this Jesus? We know him. We know his mother. We know his family. They had, they had watched him in that carpentry shop, watched him after his father died, helping his mother to raise his brothers and sisters. And, and he seemed to them completely normal. The only event we know about that was not completely normal was that time in the temple when he was 12 years old. Uh, teaching the doctors of, of the law. So even at 12, he had this, this deep knowledge of, of the things of God. So where did he get that? Well, he was um, a rabbi of the Pharisees, so educated by the Pharisees probably. In other words, knowing the Bible at certain times, the boys would memorize the f first five books of the Old Testament by the time they were 12. And there would be instruction in the synagogue. Then there was his, his godly parents. 
we don't know that much about Joseph. Joseph never speaks in the Gospels. I, I always imagine him as one of these kind of men who, uh, who works very well with their hands but never, never says a word. <laughs> anyway, we, we don't have him saying anything in either, any of the four Gospels. But there was Mary who had treasured all the words about Jesus. How much did she tell him? How much did she try to share her understanding with him? Did he, did he have any time with his cousin John growing up? And John's parents, and especially his mother, Elizabeth. We don't know of the earthly influences on Jesus, but I believe that the the fact of the Incarnation means that Jesus, when he was among us, was fully human. Fully human. He was not called Jesus until eight days after his birth. Because the angel said, you shall call his name Jesus. He was not called that in heaven. But when he did his miracles among us, it was not by his divine power, because he had emptied himself of his divine power. He did his miracles among us the same way that we can do the works of God, and that is by listening to the Father and accepting the Holy Spirit working through us. Jesus told us that's how he did it. He said, I only do what I see my Father doing. And we know that he, he withdrew many times, quite regularly, to be listening to the Father, to see what he would be doing that day or in that moment. And he had to become fully human in order to redeem us as fully human. He couldn't be like Superman going and changing and taking on his superpowers from one situation to the next. That would not be a full incarnation. For him to fully be able to redeem us, he had to be fully human. And he had to have laid his divine power down. And he did this for a couple of reasons. One is to show us the Father to help us to see how the Father works, what the Father is doing. If we want to know the Father, we look at Jesus, we look to Jesus. And the other reason is to show us that we can do this too. We can resist sin also, because he was tempted in every single way that we were tempted, Scripture tells us. You think of any of the ways you've been tempted, Jesus knew that temptation. And we can be sure that as the enemy was allowed to tempt him, we see this at, in the desert time in, in Matthew 4, if I got that right, that, the, that his temptations were just as fierce, just as bad as any that we have faced, if not worse. But he lived without sin. And that's to show us that it's possible for us not to fall into sin all the time if we stay as close to the Father as Jesus did. But he did not lead, lead a sinless life by his divine power. He had laid that down. And there are several implications to this. Um, that, as I say, we are beginning to discover, we are thinking about and talking about. Um, one is that he became flesh. You know the passage. He, make, he became flesh and dwelt among us. But let's think about that. It, it means that he entered into the material world. He took on a body, a human body. And he knew all the, the pain and fatigue 
of our existence. So when we, we say Jesus came for us, it wasn't just that moment on the cross. His incarnation meant that his whole life, he lived as we live, with the temptation, with the fatigue. I think he probably had the infant, the normal instant diseases. He cried when his teeth were coming in. He would have hurt his hands learning how to handle the carpentry tools. We see him very clearly, especially in the Gospel of Mark, frustrated with his disciples. We see him weeping over Jerusalem. He knew our human pain and suffering. We see his disappointment when even his own mother and brothers did not understand him. We're trying to call him back from his ministry. This is, a, this is important because we got lost, even in the, in the first generation, Paul writes about this, we got lost in the pervading Gnosticism of that age, which, is, um, which we see in several forms of Eastern religion, and which is very strong with us today, and that is to think that the spiritual world is, the, the invisible world is what spiritual, the material world is not. So the more mature we are, the less we're attached to the material world and the more we're just into the things of the invisible world. Because what God cares about is what is invisible, what is supernatural. He doesn't so much care about the material world. Let me share how this was taught to us in the 70s in YWAM, in our schools. We were told that... um, A couple things coming out of this this pervading, pervasive Gnosticism. One is that to, to pray to God, in other words, when you had your quiet time, you had to be perfectly quiet and perfectly still. You had to be sitting down. You had to find a place to sit that was quiet. You could not play your guitar. You could not have music going. You had to sit there and be quiet and motionless for an hour. Now, my wife Cynthia was not created to sit still. She was never able to at any age, and she would not be able to to just sit there for an hour. Finally, she she took her salvation into her own hands and risked it, by walking around the block, praising God and singing during her quiet time. And had a wonderful time with God. And she found out she didn't have to to do this religious thing. The ultimate spirituality of our day in YWAM was to sit still for an hour and preferably with your eyes closed and to pray. Maybe use your lips, but you probably weren't praying out loud just to, to do that kind of prayer. And of course we know that in other traditions that the ultimate spirituality looks completely different. For some of the Catholic traditions it's on your knees. You can't pray unless you're on your knees. For many Indian Christians you can't pray unless you're and worship God unless you're flat on the floor. For the cops they have this bowing motion they do from standing to bowing many times during their their prayer time. So the expression of spirituality is part of religious culture. It's not an absolute in the Bible. We were also taught um, that the more spiritual you are, the less you will have to sleep. In other words, sleep is giving in to your material body It's giving in to your fatigue, and what you need to do is discipline yourself to sleep less. So we were taught to turn back our alarm clocks five minutes each night. I tried this for about a week, and then I said, forget it, this is not working for me. I'm not going to be very spiritual, but I'll just have to live with that. (laughs) 
This is nonsense. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that you have to sleep less in order to be more spiritual. As a matter of fact, it's very dangerous and bad for your health. We had a Christian psychologist come and, and teach us that we all should be sleeping more. His name is Archibald Hart, H-A-R-T. He was at Fuller at the time. And he did research. He, he was treating a lot of people for depression and burnout. And he figured out it was due to lack of sleep because they were trying to be spiritual and, and sleep only six hours a night, five hours, four hours. They were always trying to sleep less and less. And he got into the, the research at the time and, and found out that um, we should all be sleeping eight to nine hours a night. And he came and preached this here in Switzerland and told us that when he started preaching it in churches in California, this would have been in the probably the late 70s, maybe the 80s, he was called a heretic, and he was not invited back to certain churches over a point that is not mentioned in the Bible. Another outworking of this Gnosticism is to say that uh, you can, the prayers that God hears the clearest are those prayed before 6 o'clock in the morning. In other words, if you really want to be sure God hears your prayer, you have to get up very early, wake yourself up, do your being violence by, by these horrible alarm clocks. I am so glad we're not going to have alarm clocks in heaven. And, and you have to pray at that time of day. And they, there are scriptures about praying in the early morning, but the people who insist on this don't tell you about the scriptures that, say, that talk about praying in the evening. And devout Jews in biblical times often prayed three times a day. And there's nothing in the Bible that says the prayers of the early morning are the only ones God really cares about. Another manifestation of our Gnosticism is that we really don't care about our material world. We worship in cement block buildings. We pay little attention to, to beautifying our environment. Some of, the, some of our YWAM bases are actually very ugly. And they're not a testimony to the people around us. They're not cleaned. We treat our vehicles very poorly. We leave trash around. We think that the material world is not important to God. This is not what scripture teaches. And the very fact that the Son came into this world to share our, our flesh, our materialness, gave a new nobility to all the material world. God created the material world. It was his idea. And he gave us a stewardship over it. We turned over our stewardship to the one who became the prince of this world. And then the, through this whole remedial thing, the Lord is trying to give it back to us. The scripture is also clear that Jesus did not die just for us. He died to redeem us so that the material world could be redeemed as well. In the Romans 8 passage, that the entire creation is waiting and groaning for our redemption. Uh, Abraham Kuyper said it this way, every square centimeter is God's creation. He made it. His son became part of it, died for it, rose again, and ascended to heaven that we might have a authority over it again. And God wants it back. Every square centimeter of his creation. Our Gnosticism is one of the reasons that it's so hard for us to communicate the importance of the spheres of society. And that the, the church's mission is, is not just souls. It's not just seeing people get converted and, and, in, and put into churches. That's fundamentally important, yes. But the church's mission is all of society. 
all of God's creation. But we still have people teaching in YWAM that the missionary call is the highest call, that it's more important than a call to those spheres. It is not. It is not. And we should stop telling our DTS students that it's God's second best for them to go work in a career in one of the spheres. And God's best plan for them has to be to join YWAM and to be a missionary. Nonsense. Scripture does not say that. We all know the rest of the story. When Jesus went to the cross, he was not killed by Romans. He gave his life. It was a choice. When the weight of our sin came upon him, he gave his life for us. At that moment, we read in Colossians, he triumphed, there was victory, Colossians 2.15, over the principalities and powers. So yes, he died to forgive our sins, that our sins might be forgiven, but there was this victory over the fallen angels, all the different classes of heavenly beings that had fallen and followed Lucifer. Lucifer. And there was that moment of, of victory in the heavenly places. And then after that, we don't know exactly when, how long after, he went down to hell and proclaimed the, the gospel there. The early church fathers believed that he did that in order that all who had died before the crucifixion would hear the gospel from Jesus and they would all have the, the possibility of converting um, at that time. They're thinking about, about the down places, the, the place of the dead, the waiting place, as we as, as the Jews think about it. Hades is the place of the dead, of the waiting, of the sleeping. Anyway, wh whatever exactly happened down there, we only have one or two glimpses of it. But we do know that Jesus came back and rose from the dead. But he had a body. He, he did not come back a spirit. And he went to great lengths to show his disciples that he had a physical body. Thomas could put his finger into the wound in, in, the, in the side of Jesus. There's an incredible painting uh, that we've been meditating on recently. Of Thomas and, and an, another two disciples there. And, and Jesus has lifted up his cloak and Thomas has his finger actually in the wound of Jesus. Jesus fixed his disciples fish breakfast. They ate with him. Yeah, he walked through the wall and appeared, but it wasn't because he had an immaterial body. Winky Prattney says it's the same way we walk through fog. Our bodies are more dense through than the fog, so we can walk right through it. And Jesus' body is so dense, his resurrection body, that he can walk through through one of our stone walls. There's a, a moment I want us to look at in um, the prophet Daniel. And let's look at that passage in Daniel chapter 7. Now, I must confess that when I first starting, started getting interested in this passage of Daniel particularly, it was, as a new Christian and all the stuff about the return of Jesus, and 
And that's, this chapter is fascinating to, to that kind of thinking because we see, it's in this chapter, we see the beasts and the horns and all that stuff. But that's four beasts and, and all these arguments we had back then about the number of nations in the European Union, which back then was called the common market and just a lot of nonsense. But this is about a vision of Jesus. Let's walk through this. Daniel is, is having a vision. The four winds of heaven are stirring up the great sea. At Daniel 7, verse 2. And that's when he sees the four beasts. But he kept looking, he says in verse 9, until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was ablaze with flames, its wheels were a burning fire. Just think of this a little bit. See it with Daniel. A river of fire was flowing and coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands were attending him, and myriads upon myriads were standing before him. The court sat and the books were opened. Here again, we have a bunch of books, and we don't know which they are. Maybe the Book of Life is one of them, but there is more than one book. The Divine Court, which we don't, we don't even know who these people are. We don't pay attention to this in, in Christian theology. In Jewish theology, they think a lot about the Divine Court. Spiritual beings who sit as some kind of some kind of panel of judgment in heaven. Anyway, let's go on with this, with this vision of Daniel, which takes up again in verse 13. I kept looking in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, one like a son of man was coming. And he came up to the Ancient of Days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion, glory, and a kingdom that all the people's nations and men of every language might serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which will not pass away. His kingdom is one which will not be destroyed. This is Jesus, and this is the moment that he returns to heaven. After having been absent, completely absent, for his 33 years, he goes back to heaven, but not as a spirit. He goes back as one like a son of man. He goes back to heaven in his human form. And all the angels came out to see. This is why the multitudes, the myriads and myriads and thousands of thousands were there at that moment. It's an incredible thing. Apparently this is not where they usually are. This is a different place in the heavenlies. There's a great sea. There's four beasts coming out. They set up the throne. The Ancient of Days, the Father himself, comes and sits. The divine court is there. The books are open. All the angels come because it's the moment of the return of the sun back into Visible to them, visible fellowship with the Father and the Spirit. And he takes his place, the authority is given to him, the everlasting, unshakable kingdom. This is the ascension of Jesus. And Daniel, the prophet of the kingdom, got to see in a vision this moment, which would happen many, many centuries later. This is incredible. Jesus is in heaven in human form. He's not a spirit. He is in heaven with the Father and the Spirit, but he sent his spirit to us. That was the promise. Just read everything he says about the Holy Spirit in John 14, 15, and 16. 
Meditate on those passages about the Spirit. Jesus does not live in our hearts. Jesus is in heaven. The Holy Spirit is in our hearts. And the, another reason that I say we've lost the Trinitarian theology is we've completely downgraded and underestimated the role of the Holy Spirit. Many sincere Christians say that the Holy Spirit did nothing miraculous after the, the latter part of the life of Paul. But that's another topic. Just before this moment, when Jesus appears in heaven for the first time, he's saying goodbye to his disciples. And this is in Matthew 28. There, they go to Galilee. Jesus has told them to meet him on a mountain. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some were doubtful. This is Matthew 28, 17, I just read. And Jesus spoke to them and said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He's speaking about the moment that's going to happen just, just after this. He says, It's mine. It's been given to me. I'm going to heaven to receive it. But you go, therefore, for that reason, because I have received all authority, it has been granted me by the Father in the presence of all the angels, the divine court, and even the four beasts. Because I have received it, you go and disciple all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even until the end of the age. He's with us always by his Spirit. So this is the fundamental importance of the Incarnation is that the very being of God changed forever. The ultimate core of, of being in the universe, the Trinity, changed in its nature, not in its unity. They stayed in unity, even when Jesus was a human being here on earth. But they were no longer three spirits united. The Son became a human being and stayed a human being, and is a human being now in heaven, with his scar on his side and his scars on his hands and feet. There is a Son of Man in the Trinity. And because he did this, because he accepted to be incarnated, to bear our material existence with all its pain and frustration and sorrows, he knew about sorrow. He was acquainted with grief, the scripture tells us. For so many reasons, many we probably don't know about. One had to be the death of Joseph. When he was probably a teenager and he had to take on not just the family business but the role of a father figure to his brothers and sisters he was acquainted with grief but he he came and bear, bore all that with us gave his life descended into hell rose again with this new body, which is like the body that we will have, our resurrection body, but we won't know, we won't know fatigue anymore or, or pain or sickness. And he did that not just to save us and heal us. He did save us and heal us. But that's not the end of us. He lifted up, I'm quoting Torrance here, he lifted us up to participate in the very light life and love of the Holy Trinity. He lifted us up so that we could participate in the very light, life, and love of Trinitarian fellowship with the Father and the Spirit. 
This is what Christianity is. This is what relationship with God is. It's not just, I'm saved, I'm okay, I don't have any more worries, and, but I'd like a healing ministry so I can see some cool supernatural stuff. There's a lot more to it than that. We are not co-workers with him in extending his kingdom, in taking it further. And our first job, which we haven't done yet, is to make sure every one of the peoples and languages on earth has heard this message. That's one of the points of this vision of Daniel 7. The kingdom is for every tongue, every people. And we know that John had a similar vision when he saw every tribe and tongue and people there around the throne worshiping the Ancient of Days and the Lamb in, in the midst of the throne. But we have to actualize what they saw in the Spirit as a future accomplishment. We have to do it. Now the good news is we are doing it. We have united with many of the other big missions and uh, Wycliffe is spearheading the translation effort. There are other people doing it as well, other missions. It's all been divided up and somewhere around the year 2030, possibly even sooner, with advances in computer translation programs, every language will have at least some of the scripture for themselves. That's the first part. And Jesus said, first this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached to every nation, ta ethne, every ethnic group. After that, the end will come. And this is why I think it's ridiculous to talk about Jesus coming back any minute, because he said, guys, after that, the end is going to come. And so some people now are starting a movement called Bringing Jesus Back, which means let's go translate the Bible and get it out there to all these peoples and then Jesus will come back. No, that's not what he said. He said after that. He didn't say in that moment, the minute after. He said at some point after that, I will return. We need to remember what he said here in Matthew 28, 18 through 20 that our, our role is not just to get the word out to every people, but to disciple the nations, to teach them all that he commanded us. His teachings, his words, are not just for Christians. They're for the nations. There are ways that we can teach the nations. If we, if we adapt our vocabulary a little bit, there are ways that we can teach the nations so that they can live much in peace, they can live in fulfillment and in prosperity if they follow the teachings of this book. That's what happened right down the lake here in Geneva in the 16th century and then came back up the lake and this mighty revival swept across Europe, the one we call the Reformation. It started around 500 years ago. And we need to work on having a second reformation, which will not happen just by prayer and worship. You've got some groups saying, well, we're going to have a new reformation and it will be catalyzed by prayer and worship. Well, that's a nice thought, but that's not how the first reformation happened. And the second reformation is not going to happen until we do some serious thinking about how we teach nations and we put that thinking into practice in the actual teaching of the nations. And doing it, as John Calvin did in Geneva, and the others did throughout French Europe, Lutheran Germany, the English Reformation, etc., etc. The Son of God said, If I be lifted up, I will draw all men to me. And we lift him up in, in worship, and we should. It is right that we do that. But he never 
went around insisting that he be worshipped. What he did say was that loving him is doing his commandments. This is stated about 20 times in John's Gospel and Epistles. And if we're going to love Jesus, there's more to it than prayer and worship. I love prayer and I love worship times. But Jesus said, if you love me, you will do my commandments. His commandments include loving our neighbors and teaching the nations. So let's love Jesus in the way he has said he wants to be loved. Because he, he loved us first of all. We should love him.